Okay, great. Good morning, almost afternoon. Um, my name is Christy Buck, and I am the executive director of the Mental Health Foundation of West Michigan. And this is Susan Meekoff, and Susan will be part of the presentation. Anyway, the Mental Health Foundation, uh, mm, between four, about four years ago, we created a curriculum that we have taken into schools to educate them about mental health, mental illness. And what we did was, um, we were created back in 1990, but our, our mission was always to reduce the demoralizing stigma that goes along with mental illness, mental health. And so the, mission, the actual mission is to create a community that accepts, understands what mental illness is. We actually, when we created the program, we did find that in the Michigan State Board of Education, they actually say schools cannot achieve their primary mission of education if students and staff are not physically, mentally, and socially healthy. Hence, this has given us reason why we needed to create this. So the goals of our program, and it is called Live, Laugh, Love, Educating Our Youth About Mental Health, is to educate the students, staff, parents about mental illness, understanding mental illness as a brain disorder, teaching and understanding the stigma related, how the media, media perpetuates the stigma, identify warning signs of mental illness, where to access help in our community, and then to educate the youth of today, of course, so that the do, adults of tomorrow show compassion, understanding, and acceptance that mental illness is a medical condition. So Live, Laugh, Love lessons, this includes um, eight to nine lesson plans dedicated to different topics. They are all 55 minutes long. And between Susan and I, and now also a collaboration with Pine Rest Christian Mental Health Services, we bring this curriculum into 33 different classrooms right now. And if you multiply that approximately by 30 kids per classroom, in the, net, in the past eight weeks, we will have educated almost 1,000 kids, which is pretty awesome. Um, first lesson plan, the curriculum is integrated into health classes. And so what we do is we contact health teachers and we bring it into their class. It's usually the class where every student is going to go through it, especially in seventh and eighth grade. And in ninth grade, through 12th grade, where we actually do some work in sociology classes, and along with a dedicated health program, one of the schools is Forest Hills Central. These are the topic areas. Um, again, mental health versus physical health. We try to teach the kids that it is one body, one system. And if you, can't, if you don't have your head on, you don't have anything going physically. We, um, lesson two is about stigma, and even that word is just a mystery to so many people, what is stigma? And so we break it down into stereotyping, teasing, ignorance, guessing, maliciousness, attitudes. And so by the end of the semester, the kids all know what the word stigma means. And it's pretty amazing when they'll see us in the hallway and, you know, we're stomping out stigma. Yeah, right, you know, keep it up, all right? So, you know, you got to play on it. You got to... Um, third lesson is self-esteem, and that is the root to many children's mental social isolation where they don't fit in. A lot of it is built in with the self-esteem. St um, lesson four is stress and coping skills, and so we actually review what coping skills are, and so we talk to kids about what is stressful to you. What is stressful to an eighth grader here at Wyoming Newhall Middle? What is stressful to you here, a ninth grader at Forest Hill Central? And of course, they're going to be vastly different. Then we discuss, we have a in the room, and kids identify their different mechanisms of coping. We encourage the kids, please be honest with, you, with us. And normally, we'll get some great answers. We will sometimes stuff the box to say, I cut. And then, of course, the kids are aghast. <gasps> Somebody cuts in this room, and they're all that stuff the ballot box, but it leads us into the next week when we actually talk about beyond stress. So now we're talking about post-traumatic stress disorder, and we have found a lot of research has shown that children, um, this is a lot of the cause, the trauma in lives of kids actually is PTSD, 
not diagnosed. And so, so many times with the kids even, they relate, because they hear it on the news, they hear it on Channel One, which is a station they all tune into, that veterans are coming home with PTSD, post-traumatic stress. So they relate it to war. And then we bring it in by showing them situations that are, can be traumatizing to a child. We also talk about anxiety disorder, and then we have a little bit of fun with uh, talking about phobias. Um, negative coping skills is the next lesson plan, and that is now they've learned stress, they've seen some anxiety, PTSD. We talk about substance abuse and self-harm. And so these are negative coping skills. Um, we've gotten great responses with our alcohol substance abuse lesson plan. It's all relative to teens and why kids should not drink. And it shows a lot of kids at 14 so many mechanisms of alcoholism and future alcohol abuse start at age 14. So when we're in the middle school, we usually get them when maybe they haven't made the decision. In high school, we get them, they've possibly maybe already experimented with marijuana and alcohol, and that's where we can say, you need to stop. This is why you need to stop. Um, and of course, self-harm, that would be uh, deliberate self-harm syndrome, which would be cutting, would be an example. And then we go into depression, bipolar illness, and this is where we really talk about what are the signs and symptoms. We teach the kids all throughout the whole eight weeks that if you have a friend who is suffering, who is showing symptoms for two weeks or longer, we really push two weeks. And sometimes we teach the kids how fast two weeks goes, and all of a sudden your friend, two weeks ago we just elected a new president, and it's like, holy cow, what's going on, you know? So when you think about that, if we can get these kids in and notify people within a month, that would be phenomenally awesome too. And then we'd go into, it's a how you can help, and it's called ACT. And this is actually introduced through a um, nationally recognized suicide program called Signs of Suicide. And what the foundation has done is we've taken a portion of this and integrated it into our curriculum, which is... Um, teaching kids to be responsible by acknowledge, caring, and telling someone about a friend or a family member if you recognize any signs and symptoms of any type of mental health, mental illness. We stress throughout the entire eight, nine weeks that suicide is the second or third leading cause of death amongst high school students, and it is the second leading cause of death amongst college students. So we are constantly every week pounding that in. I mean, and now we've integrated it in. So most of the teachers all have a mental health section on their final exam. We've provided them with the questions. What we want them to come out knowing is two weeks or longer, one in five are going to at some point have an emotional disturbance. These are teens. We want them to know that it's the second or third leading cause of death. So and we want them to know how to acknowledge, care, and tell. And so we do this, of course, through role playing. And lesson nine is um, recovery. And actually, we're there next week with uh, most of our schools because we've been in there nine weeks. And what that'll end up being is um, stories of recovery. And this is where Susan shares a lot. And that was the one thing unique about the foundation is we have employed people and our co-facilitators with us are people who are in recovery from mental illness people who have taken steps to get treatment, people who are taking their medication the way doctors are prescribing it. And so it's been pretty successful. So we'll end up doing some contests at the end of creating buttons. That's one thing we do, although those are all our original ideas going around right now. And then also designing t-shirts. So. so why are we here? And this is where we're going to, um, what I'm showing you today is actually a presentation that we have created that we want to take more into parent groups, um, PTAs, booster clubs, okay, we, um, I just attended a two-day uh, conference on suicide prevention and one of the presentations I went to was Eric Hippel who played for the Detroit Lions, who lost his son to suicide um, in 2005, I believe, and he has, he's his goal right now is to go into schools and meet with the athletic departments to show how coaches can make such an impact by recognizing signs and symptoms. 
in kids. So this also, that's kind of one of my goals right now. And uh, the foundation, we don't know it yet because I just came up with this yesterday, Susan. So we'll be talking about it next week. But it will be going into athletic departments, going in and meeting with the booster organizations of schools. So what you're going to see is that. So why we are here is we want to demystify the confusion about what is normal teenage behavior and what is not normal. We're being able to recognize signs of depression and suicide and as parents, and we'll be changing this up to say as parents, mentors, okay, uh, coaches, teaching kids to recognize the symptoms, teach them the appropriate action steps to get help. So when we actually did this, we did it for, this presentation was made for a Christian school. And I felt it was so interesting this morning with our presentation about spirituality and understanding. And we were able to actually find places in the Bible where people did complete suicide. And Saul was a big example for me because he had a winsome personality and a quick mind and it had also been touched by God's spirit and the power in a special way. And I kind of translate that to a lot of kids who end up being um, respected and popular and, and are confused about where they belong and have feelings of depression but can't come forward because I'm considered just a cool kid and a mentor to so many kids. And so I kind of see Saul as probably, he may have been the athlete nowadays. He may have been the kid that everybody liked and maybe he was in social circles. He could connect with the band folk and the jocks and maybe he could connect with the partiers. And so I think Saul may have been that way. So what should I tell my children? And when we're talking about suicide, this is, we have to be talking about the truth. We have to know the facts about suicide. We have to be able to understand this. So some of the facts, and these are things that we, um, in every presentation that we do in the community, and a lot of times we've gone into companies and done things, and we've done um, a lot of presentations to students. We've done these to parent organizations, and we always feel like you have to understand what is a myth and what is a fact. So it's normal for teenagers to be moody. Teens don't suffer from real depression. And again, when people see this, that one in five teens have some type of mental health problem in a given year. Depression can affect people at any age, and serious emotional disturbances, one in 10. We found a shocking study that found that 79% of those children never receive treatment. And so the kids actually get this too in their classroom discussion. What's going on with the other 20%? And that's when we tie in the coping skills, negative coping skills, alcohol and substance abuse. I am a huge advocate of that is one of the number one things we have to take care of and curb in these schools. And kids need to understand why they are doing this. They can't quite understand. And we relate it and tie it in totally straight back to mental health. You're drinking because you want to cope. What's peer pressure? Coping with peers. Coping with trying to fit in. And so that is a negative coping skill. And parents don't quite get it either. Okay, And in our alcohol and substance abuse uh, lesson plan, we talk a lot about the stages, stage one, two, three, and four. And where stage one might just be every now and then, I tasted it, turns to stage two, partying and on weekends. And a lot of parents are accepting of this. And I just really, it's almost unbelievable to me. And they're accepting of their kids drinking in their own home because they're not out driving. I'm just mortified. And we have to really educate more coaches about this because coaches also allow it. They shut their eyes to the fact that these kids were partying over the weekend. I'm a huge, huge advocate for trying to get this in. Why don't kids get help? And when we go back to that 79%, we're showing that that 79% do not because of stigma. And again, if you're young, and your natural inclination is to try and fit in with other people to look normal. Everyone around you seems healthy, appears healthy. So your inclination is to really try and appear well. And this happens much more commonly than one would like to think. And Kay Jamison is a psychologist at Johns Hopkins, but she also has mental illness. So she is in recovery. 
Myth, teens who claim to be depressed are weak and just need to pull themselves out of it. We heard that this morning too. There's nothing anyone can do to help. And again, we have got to teach people. We have got to let people know these are parents, coaches. Depression is not a weakness, a serious health disorder. Again, both young and old, everybody, we are at risk. And again, we stress that a lot of times the coach, the parent, you can be the link into services. Okay, friends, kids, they need to realize they are not the therapist, they are not the counselors. And when somebody is ultimately depressed, we need to re reiterate to everybody that it's trained therapist, trained counselors. And that's where a lot of times when we're getting into that ACT, A-C-T, it's not talk to someone, it's actually tell a trusted adult, tell someone that you know is going to help someone. People who talk about suicide won't really do it. Mm. Almost everyone who dies by suicide has given some clue or warning. And it might not be blatant. These might be underlying things. It might be the morning of they closed out their MySpace. It might be that they sent somebody an email. It might be a desperate cry in a change of personality. It might be the binge drinking at a party. We don't know, but we have to educate and make sure that people know warning signs. Um, of course, statements like, you'll be sorry when I'm dead. Again, suicide is the third leading cause of death. Now, in Michigan, it is the second leading cause of death, second to automobile accidents, interesting. And when we're talking about alcohol abuse and substance abuse with kids, we really drive home the fact that Fatal, that automobile accidents are usually because your mind has been impaired somehow. You might be texting. Why are you, making, why are you taking a risk to text? Okay. Again, those are coping skills. Got to get back to my friend. She can't wait for me to get back to her. Okay. So, and then I throw in a story about my mom. Of course, it was back in the 40s, maybe even late 30s. She drove when she was 14. So I'll say, and the kids will be, no way. And I said, yeah, she drove a Packard, which is this old black car, all the way out to California. She drove her parents out, 14. Now, why? Okay, she, was, she didn't have a cell phone. She didn't have ac you know, um, access to substance abusing. And of course, she was Greek, so nothing was done without moderation, because we invented that philosophy. But so... You know, you look at that, and why would number one killer be automobile accidents? Again, we relate it back to mental health. Anyone who tries to kill themselves must be crazy. And that's part of the stigma lesson plan, too, is eliminating those words such as crazy, nuts, psychotic, okay? And we really drive home to kids that to actually be called those names, to be using those for somebody who actually is feeling that way, that's stigma. That is what is stigmatizing. Most suicidal people are not psychotic or insane. They must be upset, grief-stricken, depressed, despairing, but extreme distress and emotional pain are not necessarily the signs of mental illness. And I thought that was a great talk this morning um, about the stages of depression. If a person is determined to kill themselves, nothing is going to stop them. And I have heard this on several occasions. Um, I had a conversation with a gentleman earlier this summer, and he said um, I was trying to get him to be a sponsor for an event. And he actually said to me, yeah, I had a nephew who uh, committed suicide, and we all knew sooner or later he was going to do it. And I felt so sad. I just felt almost sick when I was leaving there to actually feel that way. Even the most severely depressed person has mixed feelings about it, wavering until the very last moment between wanting to live and wanting to die. Most suicidal people do not want death. They want to stop the pain. They want the pain to stop. The impulse to end it all, however overpowering, does not last forever. And my good friend Jim Bottenhorn found these statistics from 153 survivors who survived a suicide attempt were surveyed. One in four deliberated for less than five minutes. Seven out of 10 said less than an hour, and nine out of 10 deliberated less than a day. And I watched a special on 
2020, I'm not sure which, but it was about people that um, attempted suicide by jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. And those who survived actually said once they made the leap, I think there's only two that survived, they thought, why did I do this? What did I do? I don't want to die, that whole feeling. But again, if you go back and relate to that, you want the pain to stop. Talking about suicide may give someone the idea. Ah, oh, please. This is what we hear all the time, and especially when we don't want to go into schools and talk. Well, we can't talk about it, especially after you may have had several attempts, several threats. Well, it's going to get chaotic. It's going to be like the flu, a cold. Everybody's going to catch it. Everybody's going to start wanting to kill themselves. You don't give a suicidal person morbid ideas by talking. The opposite is true. Bringing up the subject of suicide and discussing it openly is one of the most helpful things you can do. There is no evidence that screening youth for suicide induces suicidal thinking or behavior. And I remember yesterday, we were, two days ago, we were at a conference, and um, they, the first speaker said, has anybody here ever actually looked in somebody's face when you know they're depressed and actually said, are you thinking about killing yourself? That's a tough thing. I mean, to actually hear them say yes, how scary would that be? Where's the phone? And for me, so she wanted us all to remember back who's done that before. And so we had to think back. The first time I ever did that, was with my mom when I was 16 years old, and she was in a deep, deep depression. It was just horrible, and had suffered a catatonic episode, psychotic, was in Forest View for a month. I mean, I won't forget that. And as she was coming out, and it, was, it took a long time. Of course, this was back in the 80s, late 70s. And she, at one point, wouldn't get out of bed, and I had to make it to school somehow by myself. Can't actually remember that. Probably some. PTSD that I blocked out, but I remember coming home from school and actually looking her straight in the face and saying that. And when I reflected back when the speaker said that yesterday, I said, wow, I'll never forget. That was probably the hardest thing for me to say to my mom. Are you thinking about killing yourself? I won't ever forget that. And sometimes it's that. Now, what are we going to do if somebody said, I actually have thought about it. Yeah, I don't have anything to live for. What is suicide? And this is what we're trying to explain to kids. And what we want people to understand is, is that people die in different ways. <laughs> and again, some die from cancer, from heart attacks, some from car accidents. Suicide means that a person did it to him or himself. Why did they do it? and you need to be honest. And here we go. He had an illness in his brain or mind, and he died. His brain got very sick, and he died. The brain is an organ of the body, just like the heart, liver, and kidneys, and sometimes it can get sick, just like other organs. These are simplistic ways to put it. And if we understand that depression when we've looked at brain scans, we actually have a jumbling of the chemicals, and there is a big difference in a healthy mind and a depressed mind. We've got to understand this. She had an illness called depression, and this can be painful like many other illnesses. She could not see beyond the present pain. A more detailed, of course, our thoughts and feelings come from our brain, and sometimes a person's brain can get very sick. The sickness can, can cause a person to feel very badly inside, makes a person's thoughts get jumbled, mixed up. He can't think clearly. Some people can't think. They don't understand that they don't have to feel that way and that they can get help. And then, of course, some children might ask questions related to morals, good, bad, right, wrong. This is, we, we did a lot of reading about this, and it is the last result of a person no longer able to cope with the severity of his pain. You know, and it's really a struggle to look at good, bad. That's how a lot of people want to look. Good, bad, right, wrong. Bottom line is, suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. We're going to have t-shirts or buttons made up with that one on it. Whoop. 
And then, of course, we, we kind of uh, talked about that. Again, going over risk factors. And this is where parents, people, coaches, principals, administrators, they need to be aware of the risk factors. Depression and other mental disorders or substance abuse disorder in a combination with other mental disorders, more than 90% of people who die by suicide have these risk factors. They have these risk factors. Are we aware we need to go out and educate more people about what are signs and symptoms? What is stress? People need to understand what's going on with kids. Stressful life situations in combination with other risk factors, such as, I took and bolded this, depression. However, suicide and suicidal behavior are not normal responses to stress. Many people have these risk factors but are not suicidal. So um, about a month ago, I was, call, I was asked to come on TV and talk about this gentleman who took his life and killed his family out in California. And he had worked at Sony and lived in a big house. And they wanted me to relate it to this financial crisis. And then all, all of a sudden, we're going to have this you know, big stream, big, a lot of people are going to be killing themselves. Come on, we want you to talk about it, that this is going to be totally related. Well, the bottom line is, is one of our coworkers, Joel Penny, he's awesome. I said, get on the internet and get me some articles about this because I wasn't familiar and I had to go on the TV in two hours. So quickly he, you know, the internet, don't you love it? He gets me this information and I read a little bit about this gentleman and how sad he had shown erratic behavior two years ago, had been let go from another job. That was his first downfall. You know, he had had a nice high position. Okay, that led him into financial crisis, had brought in a lot more stress. But then he showed more erratic behavior in another job. His boss said, yeah, he wouldn't show up. Sometimes he would show up, sometimes he wouldn't. I mean, this guy was already showing some signs and symptoms of mental health problems. Then he went out and bought a gun in September. That is a major sign. Now he has a firearm, and what happened was horrible. So when I went on TV, I caught Susan Shaw right before I was going on, and I said, look, there's a lot bigger, there's a bigger picture here. Okay, stress was not the cause of this. He showed signs and symptoms. And if we can get more people to recognize what it looks like, we might save a lot of lives. Again, a prior suicide attempt would be a risk factor. Family history of mental disorder or substance abuse. And right now, with the way the research is being done, they are researching my generation, the baby boomers. Those are the topics of discussion. And if we really want to talk about everything we were doing in high school, it'd have to be in a true confessions room, because I'm sure I can talk to you because you're not teenagers. But we did some partying back then. And when I look back now at what our society is all about and where we are in this financial crisis, a lot of it is because of untreated mental health problems or the abuse and use of substances back when we were kids. So when we look at family history of mental disorder, do we really even know? I mean, these kids, we all need to know that at, with one in five disturbances, one in 10, this is not new. Okay, it's been around. I mean, we're talking since the Greeks were hanging around philosophizing about moderation. We've had mental health, mental illness. And if it is chemistry of the brain, all right, it's always been there. And so people need to take a hard, long look at my history in my family. Okay, was my grandfather, was he a substance abuser? Was he at stage three where he always had to have a drink, like Darren Stevens on Bewitched? He's my newest example because we all used to watch Bewitched, okay? I mean, Mr. Tate and Darren, they used to have the bottle right in the drawer at work, man. They could bring the whiskey right out and mix some vodkas and cocktails. And then every day, Darren would get home from work and he had to have his settle. He had to have his cocktail and Samantha would have a waiting right there. Boy, oh my, help me. I mean, if you look at it, and if you watch the old movies, I mean, it was all happening then, okay? So now, 
research, we have to look down deep and see, is there a mental health disorder in my family? That is a risk factor. No one's family is perfect. I gotta tell my friends that all the time. Family history of suicide. And again, a lot of times we're not gonna talk about it. Yeah, oh geez, oh by the way, FYI, Aunt June, she killed herself. Ooh, gosh, you know, we've got to start thinking about this. And that's why it's so important. It's, people are so into the genealogy of their families. And it's so important that we look at these. What happened to this aunt? <laughs> what happened to Uncle Mark? Family violence, including physical or sexual abuse. Those are risk factors. And again, that can lead back to that PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. I was abused as a kid. I was emotionally abused as a kid, physically. Firearms in the home, yes. That is a huge risk factor for suicide. The methane used in more than half of suicides. Incarceration, exposure to suicidal behavior of others, such as family members, peers, or media figures. So when I did this presentation, and it could almost be at any school, especially with kids, that have completed suicide at a school, all those kids who knew him or were, you know, my friend was his friend and I knew him, I would see him in the hall, they're affected now, believe it or not, they are at risk. So I, when I did this presentation at Calvin Christian and the parents are out in the audience, it's sad to say, but your kid has a risk factor. There was a suicide in amongst a peer in the school. So that right there is a wake-up call. Again, research shows that the risk of suicide is associated with changes in the brain chemicals, and this is where I finally started to pay attention to these words that I heard about, neurotransmitters, including serotonin. And a study, decreased levels of serotonin have been found in people with depression, impulsive disorders and a history of suicide attempts and in the brains of suicide victims. And again, we spoke earlier, it's, about, it's a systemic illness, okay? So you've got everything emotional, but you gotta look at the physical side too. And a lot of times what might start as a stomach ache in a kid, all right, the old pit in the stomach turns into, I don't wanna go to school, um, I've got anxiety, all of a sudden the grades are going down. And we talk about this in the classroom too, the old pit in the stomach, and we ask the kids, raise your hand if you've ever had the pit in your stomach, you know? So a lot of times it will go unnoticed because, oh, it's physical, it's physical, it's physical. And again, GI complications, menstrual problems, Precipitating factors, suicidal children and adolescents report feelings of intense emotional distress involving depression, of the big D word, anger, anxiety, hopelessness, worthlessness, inability to change frustrating circumstances or to find a solution to their problems. And this is big. While stressors are rarely a sufficient cause of suicide, they can be a precipitating factor in young people. And again, if we look at stress, and these were responses that we're getting from kids. And when we do our lesson plan on stress, we don't necessarily throw this up there. We ask the kids, tell us what is stressful in an eighth grader's life here at Granville Middle. How, you know, and we kind of tease them, how can life be so stressful? And I do, I get into conversations with um, some, some of my older adult friends um, in their 70s. And, They'll share with me, kids are not stressed out. We had just as much stress as they had. And I don't think so. I think that a lot of us are so much more open and honest at home, okay, to say, all right, leave me alone. I gotta write all these checks right now. I gotta pay these bills. And if I can't pay these bills, we're gonna have to, we're gonna get kicked out of this house. And all of a sudden, you get these kids taking it literally. We're getting booted out of the house. And those shoes that I wanted last week, I'm gonna cause my mom not to be able to pay that mortgage payment. And all of a sudden they, they have an understanding of mortgage payments. 
I didn't understand that when I was a kid. We didn't talk about that kind of stuff. I didn't know how much money my mom had until she died and all of a sudden I found all this stuff out. But we talk much more openly and that adds to a lot of stress. So um, another friend whose son completed suicide, she actually, they were her house was in foreclosure and this child was melting inside. He had a lot more going on but one of his stressors was the fact that they were going to be moving from this house and he felt responsible and he told his mom this. Are we moving because of me? Am I causing this move? Of course, family conflicts and a lot of times with kids, and we do this in the class. Again, when we bring up divorce about stress, how many parents, how many kids here, we talk openly, have, are from a divorce situation. Share with me what can be stressful about divorce. What can be stressful? And then all of a sudden, it's just like the melting machine. Um, Got to go to my parents. I forget my homework uh, at my mom's. I don't have it over the weekend. I can't get it done. And now all of a sudden, Monday, I didn't have the assignment because I left it at my dad's. One young woman shared after class, a lot of times the kids will come up with to us, she shared that her parents have two different styles of raising them, hence divorce, thank you. And she, um, her mother was loose and didn't care if she got her homework done and her dad was tight and rigid. And so she couldn't keep up, full of anxiety. And she was thin as all get out. I thought she had an eating disorder. So of course I followed her through the lunch line just to check it out what she was doing. Asked her what was up, how you doing? And all of a sudden the tears are flowing. We had just talked about anxiety. And take her out in the hallway. She was a barrel full of stress at home. In my conversation I found out she had friends and I checked it out because I wanted to see where she sat, where she was going to go on the lunch table. You know, and I knew some of the girls, so, all right, normalizing experience. But it was this home. It was just horrible. Life at school, again, um, I see it. I have three kids, and the overload of homework is just unbearable. And especially at the beginning of the year, I think we see a lot of... Um, depression happening between that September and October because these cramp they're not used to so you'll see this transition going from sixth into seventh seventh I think is kind of like easy going in some schools but all of a sudden eighth all the teachers are going okay uh, you, we got to get you ready for high school so you know suddenly I mean I saw my daughter having meltdowns the first month of school this year it was just, you know, I mean, I would just be able to look at her one way. What's going on? Ah, the tears are flowing. And this, it was homework overload. Now she's doing better. She's finally into a routine, knew how to do it, had encouragement from me. But when is it to the point where we got to jump in and get with the counselor at the school and say, can we back off a little bit on this kid? And that's what we did with this young lady who was really thin. Took her right down to the counselor. And this is one thing through our program that we really rely on the school personnel. We rely on outsourcing them to people that are actually going to do treatment. I mean, I could do interventions, but that's not the point. I want them in solid help. So we do a lot of um, referral into Pine Ross. We do a lot to do Network 180. Anyway, again, highlighting being bullied or exposed to violence or injury, huge. Um, yesterday we attended a session, it was called Bully Side. And uh, this phenomenon, actually the word was created back in the 70s, so it's not new, okay? I think it was in Britain that this guy came up with this word Bully Side. And um, it's horrible. And again, that is part of depression, is being bullied. We heard a story yesterday, the man who put it on, about his son who was a well-liked kid and and full of um, energy and love and very popular with different groups of kids. Not popular because substance abusing, but popular because he was a friend to a lot of different groups of kids. The band kids, the drama kids, the athletic kids. And last day of school, hazing incident, and he ends up getting egged and pushed down and humiliated in front of a whole group of people um, after school. School was done for the year, school's out for the summer, 
And this kid decides with the help of the family that he is going to press charges against these people that did this to him. And they were upperclassmen who were going to told him, you are not going to have a great freshman year. Okay, you better get a clue. So he ends up in July taking his life. And these parents, they look back, and now, yes, they have taken their anger, their grief, their frustration with the school system, and they've totally geared it into, um, I think it's called Bully Police USA. And it's just a great program where they are, they're the ones that are mandating right now that Michigan have a bully legislation, okay? And it's kind of sitting there right now, and you can contact your legislators, senators, push them to make this legislation happen. Um, it's not mandating the schools to have bullying, but it is suggesting to them to have bullying initiatives involved. Some kids, they're involved too much stress, not involved in anything. With kids, we like to stress that stress can be caused by um, overcrowding environments in school. The weather is huge, of course, you know. I know that um, at Granville Middle, there's, you know, almost a thousand kids and they're hustling and bustling to classes and that school in particular is very, very, very strict about being late for classes. And what might start off as I can't get it together to open my locker, turning it into I'm late for class and now all of a sudden detention slips are getting sent home to my parents. I mean. This kind of stuff is stressful to kids. And even though I can just say, give me a break. You were late for class. Big deal. Relax, man. You know, It doesn't mean anything to a kid. Too much stress can harm a, harm a person both physically and mentally. And again, we need to educate our kids about stress. And then again, we go into with our presentation to parents, coaches, etc. cetera. Um, what do you teach your kids? Teach them to recognize when they're not feeling well both physically and mentally. And we've got to educate our kids that it is one system. Your health is your health. Whether you might not be feeling healthy in your head or you might not be feeling healthy in your sinuses. Recognizing stress. What are their coping skills? Do we know our kids' coping skills? As a coach, if you're a coach, do you know the coping skills of some of your players? Of course you do. One might be anger, hostility. One might be a kid just shuts up. One kid might be standing back. You know, the other kid might throw the chair. I watched that at a basketball game one time, and I couldn't believe it, how stressed out that young man was. Teach them to talk to someone. I think that is the biggest lesson that we're trying to instill into everybody is, is that we've got to teach kids that they have got to be able to have one person in their life that they trust and it could be even two, because sometimes they might think it's the girlfriend that they can trust. This would be a boy, all right? When really, was it the girlfriend? And what if the girlfriend was part of the heartbreak? Okay? And a lot of times, boys will utilize that girl relationship because they're not getting that out of their boyfriends. Can't talk about the boys about how I'm feeling. They won't get it. Okay? But I can talk to my girlfriend, and then all of a sudden, they break up, and I don't have anybody to talk to. A lot of times it'll be the coaches. Teens may be helped by hearing all the reasons they have to live, but what they need to know is more to be reassured that they have someone to whom they can turn to. And we can go through that. Why would you feel this way? They need somebody to talk to. Discuss your feelings. It must be a person who is very willing to listen. Reassure the individual that depression and suicidal tendencies can be treated. And again, it is not our position to be the therapists. It's recognizing, I'm going to take these things and I'm going to encourage this child. You need to talk to somebody bigger than me, man. Okay, there's a lot going on with you right now. I mean, these are the kind of conversations that we have to have. And again, acknowledge, care, and tell. And that is one of the buttons that was floating around in the bucket bonanza there of uh, stigma buttons um, is I know how to act. So we've been hammering that down the kids in um, last two weeks we've been giving those buttons out in particular. 
when they answered the answer correctly. And so now they're all wanting these buttons. And I have to keep reminding them, when you wear a button, it means you are taking a stand. And the take a stand button's going around too. Taking a stand to learn more about what is mental health, what is mental illness, what is stigma. OK, so right now I will entertain some questions. And um, again, if you want to ask questions about the program, that's great. Susan's going to help me too. This is Susan. And um, yeah. can you hear? Will you be able to hear? Do we need to stand like Hello. this? <laughs> <laughs> um, Susan, maybe you can tell them a little bit about yourself. All right, I'd be happy to. Uh, first of all, back in 1990, I am someone uh, who was hospitalized at Forest View. Um, I was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. And it had been a long, long journey uh, for recovery because the year and a half before that, I started hearing voices um, on the inside of my head, hallucinations, um, uh, l distorted belief system. A lot of things got really jumbled up. Um, it started off as depression and went very, very uh, psychotic and very severe. Um, and so I spent about 13 years having voices on the inside of my head because medications weren't able to, to totally clear it. And uh, then a new medication came out, and uh, I don't have voices on the inside of my head. I have reality back. But the struggle was totally severe, uh, totally tough. I mean, it was, it was hard because if you could imagine living your life, um, trying to function the best you can, raising two girls alone, uh, single divorced parent, um, and trying to to make life work, and you know keep the house, to keep food on the table, work a job, and all those things it was very very difficult. But I did overcome it, and um, I got connected with with Christy um, while I w entered the mental health system. I no longer could. I gave up working, and it was the best thing I did for a while. Um, I'm back at work, working hard. Yeah, big time. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but that break in the, in the work was really awesome because I entered the mental health system and uh, was able to uh, take the time to think about me, take a, take, get, get this brain back in order, um, do what it takes. And with therapy, my own work, and with faith, um, I was able to overcome that and get back to uh, normalcy. So um, that's kind of, and then I got connected with the health program and I'm busy teaching and having a good time and saving lives. You got it. And how Susan started was we hired someone to help me to coordinate presentations. And that was Susan's job was just to get us out there stomping out stigma and creating awareness. And we'd been doing that, but we hired Susan. So first call, phone call she makes, maybe second, because we did some women's groups together. We do. Uh, church groups and we did the Rotary and we did you know the Lions Club and then she made a call to Forest Hills Eastern to the psychology teacher who was kind of put in this classroom just because she had a spare hour and she teaches so so she must know psych so they throw her the psychology class so she called Susan calls would you want a presentation oh my god get get your booties in here so we get in and first presentation we were only going to do one and it was you know stigma myth fact and then we're leaving can you guys come back next week and well okay you know we get in the car and we're driving those 10 miles back and I'm going okay this is what we got to do my profession was actually rec therapy and recreational therapy was designing programs for people with disability goals objectives and you always had to think fast on your feet so we went back and we started opening up my books I pulled out an internship folder from Michigan State, 1984, okay? And I'm going, okay, here we go. Here's some activities we can do with these kids to increase awareness, increase self-esteem. So we quickly just jotted down this stuff. And then before you know it, conferences at Granville Middle, I happened to run into the health ed teacher. Hey, you don't teach mental health, emotional health by any chance. Well, yeah. And I said, do you want a presenter, a speaker? Well, yeah. And I said, well, I've got a few different. Well, how many do you have? Can you come in for six weeks straight? I'm going, oh, my, help me, Susan. <laughs> now we're going to be in Granville. So it catapulted. And from there, we had this grandiose, grand idea to apply for a grant through the state of Michigan for anti-stigma you know, awareness campaign. And we get the money, and all of a sudden we had we went from we catapulted us into like a different sphere. It was just crazy. So we have survived, and now we've probably educated over 
5,000 kids. It will be, you know, 6,000 kids by next week that have been instructed about good mental health and acting, acknowledge care and telling. So um, we're going to be really pushing. Um, hopefully, we're going to. I'm actually going to go up north with my buddy Barb Hawkins Palmer, and we're going to go observe a woman up in Wexford County who implements this signs of suicide program um, in a one-day atmosphere, kind of like we do with the act, and we're going to see what she's doing. So hopefully we're going to even be able to bring that in. So does anybody have any questions? Yes. Um, in the last couple of weeks, I've heard of two young ladies in eighth grade not not in the same district or anything, but their friends treat treat them as kind of outsiders mm -hmm. and they don't have a lot of of close friends and it's just about destroying them. And I I don't can't relate to that obviously. But what do you do in a situation like that when you recognize that that's creating stress and that's creating feelings of of uh, low self esteem? Well, a lot of what we would end up doing, and especially if it was in the classroom, and we get this a lot because these kids will open up. It's guaranteed that after class we get these type of situations. And it would be really, for us, we would be putting them into the counseling office. I mean, they need someone to talk to. I can't set them up with friends. And a lot of it, again, it goes back to self-esteem, self-awareness, um, and a lot of it is have needing feeling the need to talk to someone and again I truly believe in counseling I believe in good therapy okay and a lot of people there's a stigma that goes along with that if I go talk to somebody everybody's gonna think I'm crazy not psycho and it's really that you know and it might be even gaining a relationship you know if it was Susan and she's trouble and it might be Susan I am going to be here next week to listen again, all right? But I am hoping, would you go down to the counseling office with me and sign up for one appointment with this person? I'm not going alone. Well, you know what? <laughs> You're doing it with me. <laughs> She's actually going. You know what? I'll start off. I will walk down there with you. I'll sit in the appointment with you. Are you sure? Yes, it's really cool. It's awesome to be able to get to talk to somebody that isn't always talking back at you. They're going to listen. You really believe so? Yes! All right. I know you, so. How do you know? Because you just heard Susan's story. And you know what? I go through that all the time where I need people to listen. I happen to work in an environment where there's a lot of listeners and a lot of counselors and social workers, so I get it for free. And you can too. Now, that, now we're done. But the fact is, is that services for children are provided for free under the Stabenow Law. And I can't go into detail about it right now. Um, but it is through Network 180, through um, Arbor Circle, and I believe Pine Rest has slots for the Stabenow Law, and these kids can go in 14 and older without the consent of a parent. Okay, and that is enormous because a lot of times the parents are the folks that hold the stigma. Okay, and um, did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huge. Oh, yeah. Huge. No, and a lot of no mutual is, respect between the parents and that no. type of thing. No, getting and they don't. No, I was going to say, getting, possibly getting connected to a grandparent might work yeah. in that situation. Yeah. Um, grandparents have are, are supposed to be wiser and uh, have grown, not always, but you know there might be that grand, that special grandparent that, they, that can be that self-esteem builder sure. uh, for that person. Sure. And when we um, put out to the kids, we'll usually, we do a quick write. It goes with every lesson plan. So they start off the lesson, and one of the quick writes might be, when life hands you lemons, make lemonade. What does that mean? When have you had a lemon in your life, and you've had to make it into lemonade? And then we always instill, we want you to write on the paper right now who is one person you can talk to, a trusted individual, a trusted adult that would care about you if something were going on. And these kids, I don't have anyone. I don't have anyone. And then I'll start off. Well, for one, you start with, you would have me, OK? Would you like this teacher? And normally, in the health ad, there's this connection that these kids make. Yeah. I said, OK, well, there's two people, OK? Do you have a 
grandparent? Do you have an aunt, an uncle? Oh, I've got that aunt. Okay, she's cool. So, question. permit from the parents before they can sit in this class and depends on the school district and so we have that prepared okay, okay. Um, that's a great question because that leads me into Dean screen also um, yes we want them to um, the parents to know that their child will be in learning a lot about mental health they will be talking about suicide prevention Okay, that's what we always like to stress. We're not telling your kid how to do it. We're talking about how to prevent it. And um, it depends on the school district. Okay, and it also depends on the school policies and how it is written. We found out yesterday, too, that up in Wexford County, a lot of the districts just mandated it right into their health curriculum that their kids are going to get this. So there is, they don't put out a permission slip. Because right here, your kid goes to the school and it's written right here under our health curriculum. Okay? Some school districts that we work with do not want to take that risk. Um, normally, out of 130 to 150 kids, we might usually get one that is excused during the session. Now, what they have found is that um, there's a uh, assessment out there and it's called Teen Screen and it was developed by Columbia University and Network 180 which is the county mental health system of Kent County they received a grant to be able to implement this into schools in Kent County so what transpired with um, it's really an honor for us that because of our program and the inter integration into schools where they administered Teen Screen where Live Laugh Love was the kids felt more comfortable to take this screen. A screen to whether or not I'm going to kill myself? I'm not going to take that. A screen that's going to say whether or not I'm crazy in the head? Okay. So the numbers, we had 90, almost 95% of the kids wanted to take the screen after they had learned about the importance of knowing where am I? Where is my mind? Am I normal? Am I not normal? And the screen is really cool because um, the county brings in six clinicians okay, who have been trained in this. The kids take it, and then each child. So if this whole room, during the day at some point, you will be called down. You will be called down. You, you, you. Everybody gets called down, and you get a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a counselor. And at that point, your results. You seem to be pretty much okay. It might be geez, I was a little bit troubled by what you answered on number four. Can we talk about number four a little bit more that you've thought about taking your life? Did you, you know, and then it's, so it's really awesome. And we're lucky to have it in our county. In the state of New York, it is mandated that every child in the state has teen screen. I did. Uh, that's for you. Okay. Um, because there are some student nurses in here. All right. Um, I would, if you would, share... Maybe what was helpful from the nursing staff when you were hospitalized, and what wasn't helpful? Okay. Um, what I'd say what, what helpful what was helpful was kindness. One of the biggest things is, is is being kind and understanding. Um, I think um, even when we have been frustrated because we're sick, and when we're sick. You do get frustrated. I mean, even with a head cold, you know you've been frustrated to, to pieces sometimes. So so even when we're frustrated, to, to keep your cool and and to be to be kind and to be I understand kind of the, the same type of counseling type. I understand how you feel. I know what you're feeling. Um, you know, and I might come back. Well, no, you don't. It says, well, we have a lot of experience. I mean, just comforting type things are really um, what works best for someone who's very, not very healthy at that moment. Um, I'm trying to think of respect. Some, respect, yes, respect. I mean, I, I, um, I don't want to be giggled at after, after I do something silly at the hospital. Um, I don't want a group of, of uh, nurses that look like they're appearing to be discussing me as I walk down the hall and I look back and I'll, well, you know, because those are the type of things that get escalated when, you're, when your mind is not well. You think paranoia is, you know, all of a sudden, oh, they are talking about, you know. So just 
be considerate at all times and very respectful. And, and also, I think a lot of it is, is if you haven't ever experienced this, okay? So it goes along with almost anything. You can never say, I know how you feel because you don't know how they feel. And so unless, and that's where a lot of times peer support, and that's the big movement right now in our state too, is hiring people, they're called peer support specialists, and it's hiring people who are in recovery who can actually say, I know how you feel. I have been there. And that's why survivors of suicide is so huge because that's what we need, is I know how you feel. I can relate with you. I've been there. The other thing that I'd like to say to nurses is make sure you take care of yourself, um, especially in your own personal time outside the job, that you really take time to, um, to uh, respect yourself and um, grow um, personally, um, emotionally, spiritually, and um, care, care deeply about you because that will certainly shine towards um, working in the job experience. Thank you. Yes? I have a question. Um, this year, I had like three young ladies um, just happen to uh, kind of be friends this year. And there <coughs> been experiencing a lot of cutting and um, self-medicating. Mm -hmm. And um, two of them are going into counseling, but one, um, she went, but it's going to be a wait. But in between that wait, she's already done something to get recommended for expulsion from school. So oh. I'm just trying to figure out how do you, you know, get this, what can we do as like a social worker in the school to try, be, you know, more than what we did. We referred her out, you know, to get, oh. and I truly believe that because she has Medicaid, she it was not admitted into the hospital. Mm -hmm. I felt like she definitely needed an admission. And that's just my own personal. But I know that if she would have had any other type of insurance, she would have been admitted that day that she went there. And the next day she came back and did this incident. I had a couple suggestions. Um, you know, uh, you, 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 you're referring out, but while she's there and she's waiting for treatment, um, taking the time to educate her about what, what she is actually harming herself with. Um, can be vitally important, um, spending time with it. Also getting her hooked up with any type of mentor um, that has been there, done that, uh, might be a good connection with her. It could be an, a, a very stable, older uh, student or maybe another staff member who's, who's been there, done that. And I think those would be good ways to just kind of like, I guess, stabilize her until she can get the help she needs. And then also check out other avenues for help. I mean, if you get one block, go somewhere else and just keep working through this, working through until someone says, yeah, I can help you too. And we've seen the situation with the not being hospitalized rather quickly. Now, I think along with the no child left behind in education, I think that that was also part of Network 180's idea for no child left behind for mental health services. But I'll have to do a little bit of research and let you know. One of the biggest things that helped me in my own recovery um, was to uh, read um, small articles. Not, I mean, I'm not when you're when you're not doing really well, you're not going to read a whole book. Sometimes you will, but a lot of times you don't. And there's a lot of uh, teen books written out there. Um, even even Soup for the Soul, Teenage Soul. I mean, those are books that that are very relative to what kids are going through. And if you can get them to read a couple articles to say, I understand, and um, you know, and, and I survived, passed through it, and I got help, and, and I hung in there, and stuff like that. Those type of messages are just vitally important, a, a survivor type, um, how to get from here to there and make it through. But it's just horrible. Yeah, it was, you know, it's kind of sad, because she had really met with my lady, and she had brought when he um, said about the book it made me remember that she brought a pamphlet to me and she said I think I finally figured out what's wrong with me mm -hmm. it was something like teens with mental illness and mm -hmm. substance abuse yeah mm -hmm. oh. and she said I finally figured out now you know when am I going to get some help and it's like the next morning she was connected to someone at the school 
Um, but like the next morning when she got into school, first thing that morning, she skipped class and just made a poor decision. Well, mm -hmm. and again, and that's, and that's normal. That's you normal know, in that predicament. But so again, we have to work on the full out. It's a huge project. It's huge for us. Okay, we have to educate administrators. Okay, there's a stumbling block right there. Okay, and there's so many things that they have to be accountable for. Okay, no child left behind. Give me a cotton pick and break. When a kid is stressed out and when they have mental health problems, you think they're going to be able to go sit through a test, standardized testing, to put them on the map, that school district, so they don't fail? This is a horrible, horrible situation. And it is not cut out for the kid that might be the least bit off track and stressed out. I go crazy. I mean, the school shuts down for six weeks <laughs> to prepare for the MEEPS. I mean, I go in there and it's like one ball of stress. And now they're going to make it into a reward system, I think, somehow, where if you're, you know, if you're a good teacher and, <laughs> I mean, I'm mortified. What are we going to do with these kids? encourage these young ladies to kind of hang around each other because I think they might be feeding off each other mm -hmm. but then I don't want to cause another stress by saying you know you shouldn't really so how do I handle that you know because they just want to be together all the time uh -huh. stay at each other's home yeah and all of their parents are concerned about you know because they've exchanged phone numbers and now they see that all of them are going through the same thing but each one brings something different to the pot and it's just causing problems oh, yeah. for them inside and you know starting outside of school. Does your school have mentors? We do. We have two advocates and that work with we have almost a thousand kids and okay. then we have and I'm I'm sure they're overwhelmed, but I mean I guess the thing is back to um, getting other people if they want to hang around there's only so much you can do. I, I believe, you know, I mean, if they're per persistent on being hanging around, mm -hmm. but I guess have other joiners that are more stable and more healthy mm -hmm. that are willing to plant themselves with those girls and spend some time with them and show them good coping skills and good ideas of how they handle life that might benefit them. And, and I mean, I, they do have a couple, but then they're, things, they're boring. They want to go to school. They want to go to class. Uh -huh. They want to get with me. They don't well, want there's to also they don't want to get any tattoos. <laughs> when I go, you know, so this is right. They tell right. me. Well, I mean, in Granville Middle, they've instilled a the teachers who have want to be involved. They have a mentoring program within the faculty. Okay, so 20 teachers said, "I'll be a mentor." I'll be a mentor. Okay, my husband, he is a security at Granville Middle. He's one of the mentors. So he's been assigned four kids. Yeah, and the social worker provided them with the names of the kids that need this mentoring. These three girls would be mentored. If she ran into me, I'd say, why are you hanging out with Tamika all the time, man? You gotta like lay off her. She is sometimes makes poor decisions. And when you're in that position, you better come and talk to me. I mean <laughs> And now I'm an adult, and I'm not the geeky kid who goes home and studies and actually hands my homework in and wants to go to school. Well, you know, they have an answer for everything. They do. It's very, very frustrating. And when she goes in, and I gave her a demonstration, I said, I know what kind of day you're going to have when I see you in the morning. When you come and your hair looks pretty and yeah. you have your hair, and I gave her a de demonstration. I put my hair uh, all over my head, and I said, when you come like that, I said, that's my first sign yeah. that you need to be with me all day. Uh, and she just looked at me, and she just couldn't believe it. I said, I know, working with you for two years, when I see you like that, I have to have you as close to me as possible to avoid some of the decisions you're going to make today. Uh -huh. And she just looked at me and she was like, right. wow. And then you got the other teachers that are telling you, you are um, you are just taking care of her all the time. And, yeah, we've seen this with the social workers. But again, I think, you know, really the insistence of involving Network 180, taking her over there, seeing, you know, and a lot of times we send these, you know, go pick a brochure up or, you know, have your mom do it. And that's just sometimes where... 
it's just awful, but that's part of the field of social work too. I feel that pain, you know, because there's so many kids out there that are desperately struggling. And Anyway, we probably should end, right, Dave? Um, I thank you all, and if you have any questions, um, I'll put some, actually like a one-page flyer about Live, Laugh, Love out, and on there would be our phone number and that type of stuff. So we thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of your day, and stay optimistic and positive. Thanks. Thank you.